Hello and welcome back for now unit two, biological basis, not necessarily content covering, right? But review. So again, this is gonna be a really fast paced video and review of topics. And you wanna be spending time outside of this video really studying vocabulary and practicing, testing your knowledge to see, do I really know this? So let's go ahead and get started. So the unit understandings for biological bases are listed out on the screen here. The topics being the neuron, nervous and endocrine system, brain, drugs, and sleep and dreams. But I want to point your attention to the skills and as laid out by College Board's binder that your teacher has is that um, skill one is conceptual understanding and just knowing the content is like 90% of this unit. All of it is just you need to know it that's what it is and be able to apply it to scenarios right and being able to identify it if you are given like a, a scenario of someone in their life and what they are experiencing the only thing that's not there and kind of goes goes above that is um, with skill two data analysis and that you have to be able to analyze data from tools that measure brain activity and we'll talk about those scans so that's just saying that you need you need to know about the scans so the neuron is the basis of the entire nervous system right and so you really want to know the basics of that, um, the basis of the biological unit, including parts as well as the functioning and how the neuron functions and fires, the neurotransmitters, and then the different types of neurons. So if you have the study guide that's available at, below this video where you're watching, you have a neuron. If you don't, just draw one really quickly on, on your paper. You wanna make sure that you go through and have each of the different parts. So dendrites receive it, meaning the message, it goes to the cell body or soma, the nucleus decides to fire or not. If it does, it goes the length of the axon, which is the longest part, which is insulated by myelin sheath, that fatty tissue that simply speeds up the message. The points of no myelin in between the myelin sheath are called nodes of Ranvier, and Schwann cells are the non-neuronal cells that produce myelin. And then at the very end are those axon terminal buds that release the neurotransmitters across the synapse. The synapse itself being the part where we're gonna talk about with neurotransmitters and having that understanding. Make sure that you also understand things like action potential and resting potential. In that at resting potential, the neuron has a negative charge. And then at action potential, right, when action potential, the electricity that goes down the length of the neuron, it depolarizes. Okay, so at resting potential, the neuron is polarized. It has a mostly negative charge. And then with depolarization, the charges start to kind of mix up. The sodium and potassium start to mix up. And that kind of is a domino effect that happens all the way down the axon of the neuron neurotransmitter so first making sure that you understand agonists versus antagonists both of these are outside meaning external substances from our environment that somehow break the um, well most of them right they break break that blood brain barrier um, and have an impact at the neural level um, agonist versus antagonist being what mimics or blocks the activity of our naturally existing neurons, or I'm sorry, neurotransmitters. So you need to both know all of these naturally existing neurotransmitters and then know how various agonists and antagonists interact at the neurotransmitter level. And we're gonna talk about that more when we talk about psychoactive drugs here in just a second. Acetylcholine controls muscle contraction and a lot of things with memory and is also associated with Alzheimer's disease. Dopamine is the rewarding sensation, okay? And that anytime you eat your favorite meal or your like your favorite dessert, you get a rush of dopamine and that makes you want to do it again, making it really hard to put the cookies down, right? Um, but also movement and thought process. It's involved with lots of things, including Parkinson's and schizophrenia, even slightly involved in depression and then of course drug addiction. Serotonin is involved in emotional states and sleep naturally existing, um, and then an undersupply of that is clinical depression. 
norepinephrine, um, physical arousal, learning and memory, also involved in clinical depression and stress. GABA actually inhibits brain activity um, and is involved in anxiety disorders, um, but is also kind of interacted with when someone consumes alcohol. And then endorphins is that feel good, you know, I don't want to say it that way. Don't think of it as the feel good neurotransmitter because that is easily confused with dopamine. If all you write on an FRQ is that it's a feel good neurotransmitter, that's not clear enough right? With dopamine, it's the rewarding sensation. With endorphins, it's pain perception. In fact, it raises your pain threshold and helps you not feel the full amount of pain. And so positive emotions and a runner's high is associated with that. And endorphins are very involved in an opiate addiction. The nervous system. I think it's good to have a big understanding of kind of the organization of it all and that under the nervous system, you have two kind of parts, central and peripheral, central being the brain and spine. And now I want you to make sure you write this down in the brain and in the spine are where our interneurons are. And then in our peripheral nervous system with somatic, autonomic, sympathetic, parasympathetic, are where our motor and sensory neurons are called afferent and efferent, okay? Um, And remember that the autonomic nervous system controls all involuntary movement. Um, So you might think, oh, well, walking, I don't have to think about walking. You're right, but it's still a voluntary movement, right? You can tell yourself when to start and stop walking. You can't tell yourself when to start and stop your heart beating. That's kind of important, or digesting, or sweating. Okay, Um, and so that would be the autonomic part. Making sure to remember that sympathetic is what physically arouses you and prepares you for fight or flight, whereas parasympathetic calms you back down to get back to homeostasis in that normal state. Endocrine system is not neurotransmitters. It is hormones and all of the various glands, adrenal gland, the thyroid, the pancreas, the gonads, um, all of those being controlled by the pituitary gland or the master gland, which is controlled by the hypothalamus. Um, And in under normal circumstances, our parasympathetic helps to kind of maintain, um, works with the nervous, or I'm sorry, endocrine system. And then in a crisis, it also works with the sympathetic nervous system to maintain and sustain that longer fight or flight response. Now let's talk about the brain. Notice that scans are up at the top here because those scans are the tools for examining brain structure and function, which requires us to understand data analysis around that. So what I'm thinking is that you're gonna need to know what these measure and how it might provide us data about the brain and what is happening. The PET scan is the one with glucose, okay? And so someone somehow consumes that glucose and we see where it's being burned in the brain, meaning we see glucose activity, therefore activity in the brain. A CT or a SCAT can, CAT scan um, takes like a 3D, almost like X-ray or MRI um, of the soft tissue, obviously, so that it's almost as if you can take a slice of the brain and see it from that angle, not just from the outside which is what the MRI or functional fMRI would be. It's just kind of like the pictures of the outside. Um, The EEG, the electroencephalogram, giving us those um, brain waves, right? We have the like electrodes all over the head and we do things with our brain and it's got the like Lichter scale or whatever that is. Um, And then brain lesions as well in that um, as a last resort, certain parts of the brain are destroyed um, so as to help with things like severe epilepsy and seeing kind of what that what that does. Now, um, parts of the brain to understand, I like to start from the bottom, right? From the bottom in the brainstem, working our way up into the center and then talking about the big part up top. Um, I'll, you guys can totally pause and look at the screen and making sure that you have all of the brain scans down, but this is essentially what I, what I just explained. So you might want to pause and get that written down. All right. And then you've got all the parts of like the old or middle brain, right? Including the brain stem working all the way up to the thalamus and corpus callosum. Um, the cerebral cortex being what we'll get to next, making sure that you understand what every single one of these do. I'm going to run through it quickly, starting at the bottom, spinal cord, 
pretty important. You know what that does. Highway from your body to your brain. Reticular activating system is what arouses you to understand and be alert when someone calls your name or to wake up in the morning. Medulla controls heartbeat. Pons controls heal or healing. Controls breathing as well as some other kind of essential things, but also sleep stages. The cerebellum being the little brain in the very back controls coordination and balance. Then back to the brainstem, up at the top of that would be the thalamus. And that is where all sensory information goes. And the thalamus decides where to send it to um, the various lobes of the cerebral cortex. Hypothalamus controls all of your drives. So thirst, hunger, temperature, and sex. The pituitary gland controlling all of the endocrine system. The corpus callosum being the only thing that connects your two hemispheres of your brain told you I'd go fast. Now uh, with cere cerebral cortex, I like to start from the front. So frontal lobe controls all kind of higher order thinking and judgment as well as your personality. Remember, and don't forget Phineas Gage at the back of that is your motor cortex. Notice that it says somatomotor cortex, right? And that the movement of your body behind that is the parietal lobe controlling all kind of um, pain perception and feeling. Hence why the somatosensory cortex is in there. And then at the very back, if you were to bonk the back of your head and you kind of see stars, that's because you've bonked your occipital lobe, which has your visual cortex and controls all things with vision around your ears, right? Think of if you're tucking your hair behind your ears, you're touching your temporal lobe, which is nice because it controls your hearing as well as language comprehension on the left-hand side with Wernicke's and Broca's area. Whew, that was fast, but hey, we gotta go. All right, then we've got psychoactive drugs making sure that you understand the types of drugs. So stimulants are what increase brain activity. Please, if this is in an FRQ, do not say that stimulants stimulate the brain because then you're not using a synonym to describe it. You're just using the word itself and they will not reward you points for that, nor should they, because there's no way to know if you really know what it means to stimulate which is what the word is, right? So things like caffeine, nicotine, cocaine, ecstasy, amphetamines, and methamphetamines all increase brain activity a lot, a lot, a lot, okay? Um, and making sure that you know what each of those, how each of those are involved at the neurotransmitter level, super important. Make sure you study that with your vocab. Depressants would be things like alcohol, barbiturates, and opiates, opiates including heroin, and all opiates interacting somehow with endorphins, and then hallucinogens being LSD and marijuana. Also making sure that you remember the difference between physical and psychological dependence and therefore withdrawal. The human brain can become addicted to anything, but it can only become physically addicted to things that somehow interact at the neurotransmitter level and therefore replace our natural supply of those neurotransmitters, hence making physical withdrawal much more physically difficult um, because of tremors and sweating and projectile vomiting and all of the awful things that are experienced during withdrawal. It's important to also remember the whole agonist versus antagonist here in that these external substances like psychoactive drugs, a lot of them mimic. They are agonists, therefore they mimic the activity of the drug. But here's the thing, they also inhibit reuptake. Okay, so that's why it's important that this is in this unit because it's all about the neuron too. And so when there's kind of cocaine or heroin or whatever it is left over in the synapse after the first round had sent, well, it's gonna come in there and inhibit reuptake so that all that extra that's in the synapse is not dissipated, it's gonna send it again, creating that longer lasting high experience than what is naturally occurring with endorphins, for instance. And then antagonists are what block the activity. So an example of that would be botulism or Botox blocks the activity of acetylcholine wherever it is that it is ingested, whether it's injected in your face and your crow's feet, or if it's ingested in the form of botulism and it paralyzes your digestive tract and results in death if you don't get yourself to the hospital immediately. Sleep and dreams, making sure you know the sleep stages and that we, um, and kind of the gist of the stages that happen there and that in stage one, the um, 
we slowly get down to deeper sleep and therefore deeper waves as well. So we've got stage one, two, and three being our deepest sleep, which is where night terrors happen, um, not nightmares because nightmares are dreams. And then we go back up to two and then REM. And then as the night goes on, you'll see in this chart that um, we actually spend less time, well, if this chart were repeated, this chart is just showing one 90 minute cycle, which is important. One sleep cycle is about 90 minutes. Um, but as the night goes on, our time in stage three shortens and eventually goes away so we can spend more time in REM making sure you understand the disorders as well. Um, insomnia, narcolepsy, night terrors, sleep apnea, stopping breathing and needing a CPAP machine, um, sleepwalking, REM behavior disorder, meaning our bodies are not paralyzed during REM like they should be because REM is when we dream and therefore we would act out our dreams. Um, stage three being the deepest sleep, hardest to wake from, but REM being the most restful because our bodies are paralyzed, but our brains are very active, making it the paradoxical stage of sleep. Dream theories, I would say that these really aren't all that important, but hey, you never know. You might just wanna spend a little bit of time going over those. Um, activation synthesis theory being an interesting one, just saying that the random neural activity your brain is having, your brain during dreams, your brain doesn't like that random activity. So it makes up this crazy story and tells you that it's normal that there's a purple elephant in your bedroom, something like that. Um, but then cognitive development, there's kind of something about that, right? And that it actually helps with that. Um, kind of supporting the idea that if you study right before you go to bed, make sure you do that. Just research shows that you will remember that information better having gone to sleep immediately after studying than if you had let some time pass. So that's what I got for you for unit two. Stay tuned for unit three. See you soon.